so I'll just make sure actually. Connectra? Can you hear that? Yeah, it, well, I heard a burst of. Yeah, I just started. And then first. you turned it down, right? Got yeah, it. Sounds good. I'll just, let's see. Uh, well, it's two o'clock now, so I might as well okay. start it. And then. Connectra creates opportunities for people living with disabilities by providing information, resources, and programming geared towards greater inclusion and quality of life. Check out some of the programs we offer through our online learning platform, Connect Together, including our Service Mondays, where we highlight a local organization or initiative. Wednesday Chair Yoga with Bobby Seal Kobiski. Thursday Adapted Fitness with Megan Williamson. Friday Rotating Dance Classes hosted by Janice Lawrence and Joanne Cuff and other initiatives, including presentations by the Disabled Independent Gardeners Association's Growable Program and our Perspective Series. Check out our updated programs calendar on our website, connectra.org, or find us on Facebook at Connectra Society. Okay, so now it's all yours, Linda. Okay. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk about gardening in a changing climate, both um, how to adapt our plants to this climate because it has been changing rather rapidly, and also how gardening can help mitigate um, climate change, ma mainly by holding carbon, maximizing the amount of carbon that we can capture uh, from the air. So it's no surprise to anyone now, the climate emergency is here. I started giving talks on this subject about 20 years ago. And um, the first couple talks, there was one each year and to like a, Canadian Federation of um, University Women's Groups. And it was really an early time. A lot of people, it, this wasn't on their radar at all. And, you know, I, I kind of thought there was a, it's not there was no interest. It just didn't excite as much interest. Now it is the most popular talk I give. This is, I just give a talk by request from groups. I don't suggest to them what I should be talking about. I give them some topics. And this is now I'm focused, I think more than three quarters of the presentations I'm doing this year to groups are about the climate emergency and how it affects plants and how we can adapt our gardens. It is having a serious impact on ecosystems and landscapes and human and animal health. Um, you don't have to look at the, the disaster in November of 2000, uh, 2021 um, on the farming, the death of the animals, but remember how miserable the heat dome was for people only two, two years ago, well, a year and a half ago. Um, that's a serious um, uh, danger to, to human health when it gets that hot. So it's affecting productivity, the economy, and unfortunately it is kind of going faster or things are getting stranger quicker than the original climate models predicted. It, when I was giving these talks 20 years ago, it was all about this may come in your lifetime, it's coming in your children's lifetime, but it's now here. And it's an increasing um, challenge just for gardeners. I mean, I'm not gonna talk about all the rest of challenges for society because they're, they're on every level and affect everyone in different ways, but I'm going to just stick with gardens right now and landscapes. And it's because of the variable weather, the, the extremely variable weather that has come with climate change, um, it, you know, I, the, the impact on plants is quite significant. So we are having higher average temperatures, yes, but along with that has come the extended period of extreme, whatever it is, high or low temperatures or even wet or dry uh, conditions. It has to do with the polar jet stream becoming much less, um, becoming unstable and losing energy and it's being destabilized. So when we get um, an Arctic outbreak 
as happened um, at Christmas time over much of Canada. It's a polar outbreak because the polar jet stream is failing. So drier summers, more rain in winter, periods of heavier rainfall, all of these things we're now seeing, increased storm intensity and higher winds. And we're all getting a new vocabulary of weather, weather vocabulary, you know, stalled jet streams and uh, atmospheric rivers. But for a gardener, the extremes, not the averages, are what are going to determine what we can grow. And, and again, I'm just recapping, just, re, just remember the last few years that we've had a very, very unusually um, extreme highs and lows um, of temperature, windstorms, rainfall, we've had drought. The February of 2019 was the coldest on record in, in the lower mainland, but it came after January like we have just, like we are having right now where we were setting warmth records. And then at the end of the month, it flipped and we had three weeks of extreme weather. So even in one of the warmest years on record globally and for us in this region, we had the coldest February on record. And we all remember 2021. In six months, we set records for every possible weather event you could think of. And our spring last spring just continued on setting a record. We've never had such a cold, wet spring. And of course, if you remember October, this last October set every kind of record for heat and drought in October of all months. So there isn't going to be a new normal. That's really my message. And it's it's not that it's just getting warmer. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry about the bananas, but you're not going to be growing bananas because the minimum temperature, the, as cold as it gets in the winter, the lowest lows are have been dropping. This is uh, temperature records for Victoria and Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island. Uh, showing that this was the lowest low achieved every winter. And here is the, uh, the line averaging that, and that's been going down. So we're actually getting more extreme cold. And yet our winters are warmer on average because we have, of course, weather like we just had this last this month setting records for warmth. So how does that affect plants? Well, the climate change um, disrupts the way plants have, have evolved to be um, adapted to the seasons. If it's warmer in the spring, buds, buds break earlier, the flowers open earlier. And in some parts of the continent right now, buds are opening on, on trees 20 to 30 days earlier. But because of this highly variable weather that I just showed you some examples, that means that the risk of the late frost in the spring actually hasn't gone away. So you now have trees more likely to bloom sooner, but you still have the same or even maybe an increased risk of a heavy frost later in the spring. So that, you know, of course, risks are fruit trees. The other, at the other end of the season, um, trees that are growing too vigorously, that are suddenly hit by a early cold, they haven't hardened off properly. And that can be damaging in itself, but it also, the plants don't leave their uh, they, they don't lose their leaves as they should. And the process of lo losing leaves, plants take the nutrients that were in those leaves and basically they reabsorb them back into the tree and store it in the, in the roots and in the, in the, under the bark for use next year. But if those leaves are killed prematurely, that doesn't happen. So there's injury, there's less food for the tree. So there's, this can happen. In our gardens during the summer, um, we, you know, as coastal gardeners, we're pretty much used to low temperatures. We know that plants don't grow when it's cold enough. Our vegetables just sit there and look at us when it gets cool enough. Um, they don't, they don't grow. But what people have not realized, I think, because, you know, gardeners in this region, we just haven't had to deal with the heat. High temperatures are also lost growth days. Photosynthesis in our garden plants really stops above 25 to 35 degrees. That's just, uh, we've had a lot of days where it's that hot during the day. When it gets that hot, the plant literally stops growing because it has to conserve moisture. So it closes the stomata, the little pores on the leaves to prevent loss of moisture, which means it can't photosynthesize. It can't get nutrients from the soil. It's just waiting there. Uh, so we can have um, vegetable growth delayed in a really hot summer and end up by fall with not having carrots that are very big or cabbage that are the size we expect. 
Uh, if it gets hot enough, it just kills the leaf, leaf cells and fruit cells. And then there are some other stresses and disorders. I'll show you a few slides in a moment of that. And poor, poor flavors in food crops can happen because of high temperatures. There's less sugar for the plants to store in their roots or fruit. What happens to biennial vegetables? Uh, I'll just mention this is a side effect of cool weather. If we get cool weather later in the spring and people have planted something like chard or onions, which are biennials, uh, means that they have a two year life cycle. Um, if, if they planted that and there's a, a cold chill that maybe happens a month or so after the plants are put out, the plants are faked into thinking they're in their second year. The cold chill of winter is what tells a biennial plant, whether it's a flower or a vegetable, tells it that it's in its second year and now it should produce seeds and make, make flowers and produce seeds. So if you plant chard too early or onions too early and they grow for a while and we have a late cold chill in the spring, in April, by July, all of your plants may be flowering, which is quite, a, quite annoying um, if you've gone to all the trouble of growing these, but to have them all go into flower in the middle of the season means that they aren't producing the crop. Um, when we get to heat waves, um, they, uh, something that we, again, uh, coastal gardeners have not really been familiar with is the effect of high temperatures on the pollen of things like our tomatoes and peppers. Um, as soon as it gets hot, too hot, the, the pollen is sterilized and then the flowers fall off. If the, if the fruit fell off, you'd see that happening. But blossoms just not setting fruit. You see, here's one that just fell off here. It's gone and you wouldn't really miss it. You wouldn't know it was there, except you'd notice that you didn't get as good a crop as usual. I said earlier that, um, that the, the leaves close up their little pores called stomata when it gets too hot or dry. If it's very dry or very hot or hot and dry together is even more devastating, they close up those pores to stop losing moisture, but then they've lost their ability, the cooling effect of water evaporating from the leaves. And that means even more, uh, uh, a higher rise in temperature, which means more leaf damage. You can see there's burned leaves all through this flower garden here. And they can't photosynthesize, so they're not going to produce any food. And they're not getting any water from the roots because there's no evaporation. So they're basically sitting there waiting for conditions to get better. And, and here's a tip, if you're, you know, this looks like a very nasty disease on leaves. But if um, it's happening to a lot of unrelated plants in the same growing conditions, you can tell that it's something wrong with the growing conditions because no plant diseases go on all kinds of plants. Plant disease, plant pathogens that would cause leaf injury that would look like this are really specific to certain plants. So if you had a disease that affected lilies that badly, it would never affect columbine, which is what's over here, or rhododendrons. This is a typical sun skull. This is just plain heat injury on leaves and also fruit. This is uh, apple and uh, raspberries during the heat dome, which happened at the very end of uh, June. A lot of raspberries were ruined. And this is not disease. This is just, they've just been fried. Same with the tomatoes. But typical leaf injury means that the damage is farthest away from where the moisture is in the leaves on the veins here. And you can see on this rhododendron, they, um, you can see the shadow of this leaf right here uh, kept this leaf below it from frying, but this is a very typical heat injury pattern. And I said, I would also show you some strange slides of growth abnormalities. Um, this is a squash flower that has male and female parts developing in the same flower, and it should not be like that at all. Cauliflower immediately comes apart like this. This is edible, but it's very strong flavored. Um, it doesn't taste like sweet, like sweet cauliflower at all. Uh, this is what happens to sweet corn when it gets severely stressed by heat. Um, the, the pollen and the silk formation doesn't happen at the same time and it gets out of sync and then there's, this is what you get. So there's some pretty weird things that happen to plants in heat stress. 
And of course, we get more generations of some pests, and some of these are fairly destructive. Coddling moth, we used to pretty much count on two generations a year, but a lot of recent summers, we've had probably three generations, which is significantly added to apple damage. Um, root maggots, fruit flies, and this fruit fly here, the warmer it is for longer, we can have many, many generations in a summer because um, they only have a, a week to 10 day generation. But, you know, remember it isn't just heat. This is last spring. Uh, this is an April 10th picture. And actually I think I have another snow picture from April 20th last year and just was cold and wet. It was actually cold and wet really till the end of June. We didn't have snow till the end of June, but we certainly had a lot of snow in April. And we've had this continuing La Nina weather pattern, which is a cooling pattern for three winters, which is really unprecedented. Usually it's one winter, maybe two. And um, it's now um, predicted or that it'll be breaking up this spring, but then we will then be moving into the other side of that pattern, which is El Nino, and that's a very warm pattern. So it could get quite hot. So the effects of a cold, wet spring, um, we lost a lot of pollination on fruit trees and berry crops last year. The insects couldn't get out. It was just miserable weather and they can't pollinate and then the trees don't have any fruit. Some diseases were really bad. Things that thrived in cool, wet weather. This is apple scab here. This apple uh, leaf disease was so bad that even blossoms were dying. And this is a picture of this problem that I just was mentioning of biennials. If they're planted early and growing really well, this is in vegetables, and we get some cold weather, some of those plants, this one here, for example, will decide to send up a flower stalk instead of making a cabbage. Real, it's premature flowering. And plants that are warm season or adapted to warm temperatures, when it's cold, they just can't take up the nutrients. This is the same variety of squash that I grew. And I kept some plants in my greenhouse during the, at night and put them out during the day in the sun. And the others I planted in the garden. And this is a picture at the end of May, but these poor things that were put in the garden are failing. In fact, I think they all eventually died. They just can't do their normal cellular processes if it's not warm enough for them. Cabbage would have been okay, but not squash. The effects of extreme precipitation changes, both drought and water logging, uh, say in the wintertime, um, kill roots. So the, the fine root hairs can dry up and die, but they can also suffocate from lack of oxygen. So when the fine root hairs die, then the next size up root hairs die and then the fine roots are dying. So there's a root pruning effect, which means that the plants, usually big trees and shrubs and things, can't take up nutrients and water normally. They're even more vulnerable to dry, to dry soil next summer if, they've, if they're missing some of their roots. And of course, root diseases can thrive in these kinds of conditions. And you get trees blowing down more easily as their roots are pruned. Um, and especially if, they're, if people have allowed ivy or something to climb up the tree and further uh, um, cause it to catch wind. So, it, you know, root damage, which we can't see happening, plays a key role in how well our, our boulevard trees are doing and our fruit trees are doing and susceptibility to disease. General tree stress from our longer, drier, warmer summers and in this case, last year, it was a, the long dry fall. In fact, we're barely achieving lake levels now uh, that we should have had last uh, November. So the trees are failing and it's pretty obvious looking through the landscape that, that there are stressed trees. The, the, the Western red cedar is probably the one that people know the most, which is just disappearing throughout our landscapes our natural areas and our, and our um, cultivated landscapes, it's disappearing pretty fast. Uh, has been really noticeable for about 15 years, but I noticed it seems to have accelerated in the last two years around where I live. Maples are also suffering, and you may have heard reported in the news a year or two, um, the Salal, coastal Salal was dying back, and there was a lot of questions as to why that might be, but they're pretty sure now it's climate stress. 
And any plant that is stressed by conditions um, that are poor for that plant is open to attack from insects and, and disease causing pathogens. Borers getting into trees are usually only able to do that when the tree is weak enough to let the borers in. When borers get in trees, it's a sign that the tree is already beginning to fail. It, the, the failing uh, continues with the borers, but the tree was already um, going down. And aphids, for example, this is aphid honeydew on, on, on boulevard trees. Um, they're shiny, it's shiny, sticky honeydew, and it drops onto cars below and it gets on sidewalks and things. That is, uh, aphids thrive on trees that are drought stressed. They can grow much more easily on trees that are drought stressed than on trees that are getting enough moisture. And of course, anytime you have a tree that's weakened, diseases can, ca it, they can um, pathogens can get in and cause disease. And we get some pretty strange, thing happen, st strange things happening to our crop plants. And it's an interaction. And I think of something like an apple tree or a tomato. Um, these um, plants have been developed or bred by humans to do a very um, hard, hard job, a, a job of hard work to produce that much food that we can pick. So there's not like wild plants at all. These are plants that are actually working metabolically really hard. And so when you get any kind of stress at all, the balance between how the plant metabolism is working and the weather and how we're, how we're taking care of it, whether it's the way it's being watered or nutrients in the soil or how we might be pruning the plant, they all influence nutrient levels in leaves and flowers and fruit. Um, one of the most common dis group of disorders, however, comes from calcium deficiency in the tissues. And you'd think, well, it must be that they're not getting enough calcium from the soil. But these disorders happen um, it, when the soil has plenty of calcium. It's because when the plants are heat stressed or drought stressed, they can't get that calcium. It's down in the soil. When the plants, it gets too warm or, or too dry, both or a combination, close those pores on their leaves, they can no longer get any water or nutrients from the soil. So they're now in a deficiency situation. They're just sitting there and there's not enough calcium for the cells to carry out their normal uh, processes in especially fruit. Uh, fruit, um, when a tree is short on calcium, the calcium is moved into leaves and it, the fruit doesn't get enough, uh, doesn't get as much. And in both cases, what we're looking at here, although it looks horrible and it looks like a disease, this is calcium deficiency. And in both cases, it was caused by insufficient water in the soil and a combination of temperatures that were really high. This grower lost $3,000 worth of peppers and tomatoes in a heat wave because his irrigation system wasn't working very well. But this is an apple that's out in the um, outdoors and it just, was, it just was too hot and too dry for it. So um, that's just a typical you know, sort of view of what, what can and what is happening to our plants. So how can we make our food gardens and our landscape plants more resilient to this, um, this weird weather really? One, we can think, rethink what we're planting, choose more resilient plants. I mean, you know, people in Winnipeg do grow very cold, hardy things, and there are hot parts of the prairies where, you know, plants tolerate the summer heat, but we just haven't been necessarily growing them here on the coast. We've been very um, lucky, I guess, being the warmest region in Canada, and so we grow a lot of plant material that nobody would grow anywhere else. So first we need to back off and think about how cold we need to worry about. I, I'm showing you that the winter temperature minimums are going down, which means that certain plants that are right on the edge of their range or you know, people are trying to grow something that's not quite for their zone. Gardeners do this all the time. We're always trying to push the envelope, but those are the plants that are really vulnerable. Um, another thing is to really convert, if you've got annual plantings, to move into perennial plantings. Once perennials are established, usually they're less vulnerable to bad weather. And sometimes when they're really well established, even if the tops are damaged quite a bit, they will come back from the roots. And generally, as a group, they need less water than annual gardens. 
And then of course, water availability in this region is going to always be a problem. And so anytime you're landscaping, planting things that have a low summer water requirement, these two gardens here are just, uh, are both virtually, virtually don't require any water in the summertime by the choice of the, of the plants. And I really urge you to look at the native plants that are really resilient. Um, growing things that don't need much irrigation, if any. There are a lot of really beautiful, really durable plants. And the ones I'm showing here also feed beneficial insects. They feed pollinators. Uh, that red flowering current feeds bees, but it also is a, a extremely good for uh, hummingbirds. <clears throat> so there's some really tough, quite lovely looking plant material that's native that will benefit our, um, we're losing insects and we're losing wildlife. And these, this would help, this helps to provide some habitat for them. For landscape trees, you know, a tree is an investment in a very, very long future. And it's always really sad when I see a beautiful uh, urban or suburban tree that now is failing because something has changed in its environment. The climate change is putting a lot of stress on trees, but also things change as people put in roads or divert water goes one way when it used to go another, or you know, um, there's just changes in landforms around trees or buildings. So it's hard to know what to plant now that will survive changes later. Now, Metro Vancouver has made a tree list of trees that they're they're guessing or they're hoping, um, you know, based on, on climate modeling and the properties of these trees, you might want to look at their list for trees that would be a better bet to plant in, in, for future, to be, to be more durable. So first, you always want to look for, for things that are well adapted to your soil and your site. You might need to improve drainage, even you may not have used to have, had to have done that, but now there may be these heavy uh, spells of rain, you may find that water is standing too long in one place in the winter and that will, uh, uh, if the soil is waterlogged, it kills roots. Some of these cedars, maples, birches, hemlocks are seem to be um, suffering the most. I've had over the 20 years I've lived here, I've had all the hemlocks fail up on the mountain up where I live. The cedars are long gone. Um, so some other trees here, the spruce, the fir, the juniper, arbutus, they seem to be less affected so far. And then, of course, we want to stay away from any of the trees that are more susceptible to breaking because of, uh, you know, heav heavier windstorms. And I just add that, you know, you may not have ever thought of a fall pruning session, but it's now a really good idea to storm proof any of your woody plants before winter, which means, well, for one thing, get, get all the climbing vines off of trees. Whether it was an ornamental, um, you know, uh, like letting a wisteria go up a tree, or whether it's uh, an invasive plant like uh, ivy, get it off the tree trunks because it significantly adds to the wind load on that tree, but also snow loading. If we get wet snow that freezes, uh, it's a massive weight and that will bring trees down. But uh, from, for wind, there is another aspect of, of storm proofing, which is to reduce the bulk of climbing material. This is roses on a trellis here, um, and grapes on vines, and any kind of other cl climbers, whether they're ornamental climbers or food crop climbers like kiwis or grapes. Get um, a large chunk of the surplus wood off those plants before November or sometime in November, because that protects both the plants and the trellises they're on from being brought down by heavy snow and high wind. And you can, you can just do, you don't have to do the, you're not doing your final pruning, but at this time of year now, February, or sorry, January and February, you can now do your detailed pruning and really shape, do whatever you need to do in terms of final shaping. But there's a sort of a bulk pruning that probably is as, well, I'm, I've taken to doing it for the last five or 10 years, to protect plants during the winter time. And I'm also, I'm finding that hedges and things that get really beaten down by wind or heavy wet snow are um, remain in better shape if I actually bury within the hedge 
steel stakes um, that that um, allow the that help support the, the plants, keeps them from being tipped or broken, and you don't really see those stakes. They're sort of like an internal frame. And anytime you can design a sheltered garden, this is a vegetable garden, protection with windbreaks or fences, that is less, uh, the plants are less exposed to wind and cold injury, that it, it always is more uh, successful as a garden. When it comes to choosing other plants, uh, for example, in uh, vegetables and flowers that we're growing in our uh, gardens, the diseases of wet weather can be really bad in cool, wet spring weather. So choosing plants that don't get the diseases that are common in that kind of conditions, like uh, scab is a fungus disease. There's one that goes on apples and a different one that goes on pears. And there are a lot of apple varieties that are resistant to scab. That means no matter how bad the spring was, those apples will be fine. But there's downy mildew and botrytis. Um, this picture of tulips here, the tulips over here are badly affected by botrytis. This variety here is growing right beside them and they're looking much better. So there are some diseases of dry weather, powdery mildew, and, and it's always, we've always had problems with these in our crops and our roses and things and our delphiniums and stuff like that. So um, always read your variety descriptions to, to find, um, to, to look for disease resistance. And I'll just give the, the scab example this year was just, uh, wow, what a difference it was between apples that were resistant to the disease and apples that were um, not resistant. Uh, this is a uh, gala, which normally I do. These are my apple trees. They're, they're side by side, these trees. Um, I, I love gala apples. They're a lovely apple, but they're a very susceptible to scab. And this year I got no crop. You can see this is a dead blossom. I had some early damage here, but later by the end of the by the end of the season, this is what the apples looked like. And here's a honey crisp, and every honey crisp apple came off the tree looking perfectly, yeah, perfectly perfect. I've still got lots of them in the fridge, and I didn't spray the trees or I didn't do anything. This is simply the difference between scab resistant and scab susceptible varieties. So we're gonna to have to garden smarter in what we grow. So choosing fruit trees with a future, well, um, going back to the problem of trees blooming too early, tr you know, try and have varieties that bloom the latest possible. There's actually a, quite a spread between early and late blooming apple trees. And the later that a, a tree is likely to bloom, um, better, <laughs> the better odds are that it's not going to be killed by a late frost. Self-fertile trees have a much better chance of pollination in bad weather. Now, that's not going to help you with apples and pears because they're not self-fertile. But there are many plum trees and cherry trees that are self-fertile, and they will get better pollination than the varieties that need a cross-pollinating um, tree. Of course, the disease-resistant varieties like I just showed you can make an enormous difference in what you actually successfully get. And then there are some trees that are really susceptible to the stress disorders that I showed you due to the heat and drought. Um, Bitter Pit was the one that I showed you a picture of. Um, and this is water core here in apples. This, these trees are quite susceptible to that. So they're more susceptible than um, other varieties that could be in, in the same conditions. When it comes to vegetables, one thing I, you know, I, I teach gardening. I've been teaching gardening classes for years, and I really strongly suggest that whenever you're growing a crop, grow several varieties of each crop because there's some really big differences um, between how this variety of cabbage tolerates cold weather or that variety of onions tolerates dry weather. Um, there are differences within the varieties. I had someone tell me uh, or ask me once. He said, you know, with the climate changing the way it is, does that mean we're not going to be able to grow carrots or cabbage because they're good old Pacific Northwest cool weather crops? And I said, no, that's not the case at all, um, because there are some carrots that can handle this weather, and there's some cabbages that can and some that can't. When it comes to lettuce, um, we haven't been growing heat-tolerant lettuce much, 
but they grow lettuce in Israel and Hawaii. There are certainly heat resilient lettuces. It's just that we need to get those varieties. So none of their crops are off the table, but there's some varieties that are going to handle it a lot better than other others. Um, you know, and some crops are really kind of tricky, like cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, sweet corn, really big fruited tomatoes. They're much harder to grow and get the kind of conditions that will allow them to ripen than the smaller fruited ones. There's a lot of smaller fruited tomatoes can take uh, much more adverse conditions. And really, if you're on a, have a food garden, um, you know, trying to move to year round cropping, it's, it's, um, it's a way of getting um, quite resilient plants, because if you can put hardy plants that have been out in the garden in the winter, they are, they have really deep roots, they have, they grow really fast in the spring. And this is a picture actually April 12th, and this is the same area in the garden later in May. All of these kind of weird looking plants got through the winter just beautifully and are producing far more than I would have been able to get by putting seedlings in the ground in the spring. Pests, you know, slug can come along and cut off your charred plants pretty quickly if they're tiny and um, you know, cold weather can kill them, but the deep roots and the really hardy plants overwintering can be quite productive in the spring. So maximizing all the year round. There's another aspect here, which I will cover more in a moment, which is that these deep roots hold more carbon in the soil as well. And that's something we're going to want to think about doing. So adapt to plantings to whatever is going on in the current weather and plants that you, crop plants that you put in may fail from heat or cold. Get them immediately out of the ground and plant something else. There are a lot of varieties that are what are called short season. They might say they're just 40 days, 55 days zucchini, 50, 50 days uh, snap beans, things like, excuse me, things like that. And things like turnips and beets and a lot of leafy greens can be eaten when they're quite young. So even if you have a failure, you know, we get to July and your melons are finally just not going to make it. You can take them out and put another crop in its place and still use that ground to produce something. And I think as gardeners, we're going to have to learn how flexible we have to be. This may be a year we're going to eat a lot more cabbage and lettuce, or this may be a year where it's really hot and the lettuce isn't going to do very well in the summer, but we can grow more bush beans or we can grow kale. So um, we're going to have to be on top of things more than, than we used to be. And I, I'm, always, I'm always an advocate to learn to save seeds because if, if, if something has done really well in your garden and handled the weather and you save seeds from it and you keep doing it and you get seeds from other people that have done it, we gradually get a continually adapted variety to, our, to the weather and to the drought conditions. And a lot of vegetable seeds are actually quite easy to, to save. And, you know, there is a, a, an issue of seed security. You might hear that if you get interested in seed saving or, or get some of the organizations locally that are advocating this and helping gardeners. It's increasingly an issue to have enough seed and have a seeds of varieties that will do well. And any contribution you can make as a gardener, of course, that's all to the good. And I just put a little note in here, adapting seeding methods to the current weather. Um, again, if you're familiar to, with gardening in this climate, I'm sure you're very used to dealing with cool or spring weather. The soil's too cold, wait till it's warm enough to grow certain vegetables. Um, and if it's, if it's really cold, wet soil, you can put some clear plastic over to help warm it up. So coastal garden know, gardeners know these tricks about warming up the soil and you know, having the soil warm enough for seeds. But what we are less likely to know about, and we're all just learning this, it's a pretty steep learning curve for a lot of gardeners, is the soil can be too hot to grow certain seeds. It, 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 actually, you can put lettuce or parsnips or carrots into perfectly moist, lovely soil. And if it's too warm, the seeds won't germinate. They just, you know, who, who would have thought of that? We are always been worrying about our spring seeding. So in that case, when it's, um, you know, very warm and we can have a heat wave early in May that can make it, can kill the carrots that you were trying to grow. 
So if it is warm, it doesn't matter whether it's May or July when you're trying to grow your seeds. Sow your seeds a little deeper and then shade the seed bed. Now, after you've watered, you know, sow the seeds, water the bed really well, and then put something over the bed. Now, this is burlap, um, you know, old beach towels work. If you've got, uh, you know, a bag that compost came in, cut it open and turn the white side up. It makes a really good uh, uh, shade for a seed bed, an opaque white plastic bag. And be ready for heat waves anytime. We have had heat waves at the end of April. We have heat, had heat waves in October and from in between. And they come on, you don't get a lot of warning. You know, that heat dome went, we didn't even get very much warning from Environment Canada about that. So just have your shading materials handy. So the priorities for covering when it's really getting warm are of course your little seed beds. This is a, this is a bed of carrots that hasn't come up yet. But here, these are seedlings that had come up, but they've just come up and they're too tiny to even put mulch on. So these kind of upside down seed trays works, actually works very well as a little, uh, you know, very quick um, um, seed bed shade, but um, also shade cloth. You know, this is, works really well. And you can shade seeds, seedlings, and there's some cabbage and uh, lettuce plants back here that are small. Uh, as soon as you can get fine mulch around the plants, do that. Because the roots are so close to the surface on these little seedlings, they just fry really quickly. It would be better for them to be shaded than it would be to get full sun because the full sun is just going to be fatal. Um, you know, if, you, if they're too shady, they'll just slow, grow more slowly. But if it's too hot, they die. If you can increase your watering, of course, do that as well. And invest in shade fabric. Um, now, this doesn't have to be expensive. This is a uh, lacy curtain material from the thrift shop, which I think I paid 50 cents for. Um, this works. Oh, or you can buy shade cloth, or you can have a fancy little gizmo that you buy at Lee Valley Tools. There's, so there's, it, it, can all, it can be pretty quick and dirty. Um, just what you're trying to do really is let some light in and prevent some you know, about half the sunlight if you can cut half the sunlight getting in now shade cloth is sold saying that it's like 50 percent shade cloth means that it's cutting out half the light and that's ideal if you're using um um lacy curtain material some sun gets through this if if it's an emergency you can use old bed sheets and you, you use anything you've got but if it's opaque like a bed sheet, then it's better to put it on at about 10 o'clock in the morning and take it off sort of 3.30 in the afternoon or so, so that there's morning and after, late evening sun so the plants still get some light because they are still going to have to do uh, some growing. So if it's opaque, you put it on and take it off in the hottest part of the day. And if it's 50% shade cloth, you can leave it on covering your plants until the, the heat wave is over. Or you can build wooden lath structures like this. These prefab panels are at the lumber yards, but they're starting to get really expensive. And they used to be actually quite cheap, but uh, you can make a thing yourself and just fold it up and put it away when the hot weather is over. People that do basketry can make themselves some dandy little lightweight panels that they just prop up over their vegetables. If you're using greenhouses or plastic tunnels, they just often don't dump enough heat. And we get into a, a severe heat wave. Yes, you open the doors, get the vents wide open. Um, you may have to install more vents if you can. You may have to use fans to move the air. And you may also need to just put shade cloth over the tunnel or over the greenhouse. This is typical heat injury of tomatoes. It can very easily get too hot for tomatoes in a greenhouse. They are warm weather crops. They are not hot weather crops. And at the other end of the spectrum, those late spring frosts are gonna continue. So we're not out of the woods when it comes to spring. Be prepared with just whatever you need to, to keep on hand to quickly cover seedlings, young plants. I thought you might enjoy this uh, Victoria, old Victorian glass cloches that I saw in a garden in England. But you know what? Here's the modern cloches, the plastic milk jug or the sheet of plastic. Um, doesn't have to be expensive. 
Um, this is actually floating roll cover, which can be, or sometimes called fleece, that you can just lay down. It's very lightweight and just lay it down on vegetables and keep them a little warmer um, from frost. Incidentally, don't be tempted to use this as a shade cloth. This is meant to trap heat. And, and so the last thing we wanna do when it's really hot is to trap more heat on our plants. So if you've got floating row cover, although it looks like it's cutting down the light, it's actually designed to let most of the light go through. So it's not a good shade, shading uh, material. So just keep that folded up until you need it to keep things warm. And we do have to be prepared for actually worse, colder and longer cold spells uh, in our winters. We've always had Arctic outbreaks, but often just a few days and uh, they're getting longer. And we've had some, as I said earlier, we had three weeks in February a couple of years ago, which was set all kinds of records for how long the prolonged cold. So be prepared to cover things that aren't, aren't completely hardy like vegetables. You can have permanent covers, more permanent tunnels and things. But if, if you do build something, it should be very sturdy for wind. It's this one latches down here and it had rebar legs down in the soil and uh, very sturdy. This is greenhouse film. It's not just uh, polyplastic. So it's a, it was actually a good, well-designed, home-designed little tunnel. You'll see lots of designs, but what you're looking for is low profile, really sturdy, well-secured, uh, for wind, and this will also shed snow. The other thing you can do is just have temporary sheets of plastic ready to throw over vegetables when it gets really cold, like it did uh, the week of Christmas, before Christmas this year. And, uh, it, you know, take the covers back off when you don't need it. Plants have been out in my garden growing. They got a little bit flattened by all that snow, but they were warm enough. This is a, this is a bit of a hassle to do. It's sort of fiddly but it's cheap, it's really cheap. Because when it's really cold, it doesn't even have to be clear plastic. It can be any kind of tarp, whatever you've got. If it's opaque though, you should get it off the plants as soon as it warms up a little bit. And of course, cold frames, tunnels, these old school frames, this is from almost 200 years ago from a, a manor house in England. You know, I'd wish I had cold frames like that right now because they're really going to keep plants warmer in the wintertime. Mulch year round. Um, mulching, um, the putting organic material on the surface of the soil, it helps cut down um, water loss in the summer, but it also keeps that soil cooler. And then in the winter, it protects the soil from erosion from heavy rain, but it also keeps it warmer. And then all the other kinds of good things that mulches do, that they control weeds and they, as it breaks down, it feeds the soil and builds organic matter. So it's, 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 it's the one gardening thing you can do that seems to solve a lot of problems in gardening. And it does make your garden much more resilient to the uh, to weird weather. So I just, I just pull it back in the spring so the soil will warm up. And as soon as the seedlings get big enough, I just push it back right on the beds. If you use straw, it lasts a couple of years like that. Uh, this is leaves from uh, fall leaves that have just fallen in the neighborhood. They break down quite quickly uh, in the spring. So I, you, get, you just get one season's use out of leaves. But if they disappear, where they disappeared to is into your soil, which is all to the good. So be ready for heavier rain. And if you have to improve drainage somewhere so that the beds are not waterlogged, you may have to raise the bed soil up if they're getting waterlogged. Um, be mindful of that and keep the soil surface covered. If it's not living plants, it should have mulch. So cover every inch of soil with something to protect it from soil erosion. Plan for drier summers. And for many years, people have been, uh, you know, workshops and incentive programs to get people to put in water conserving irrigation systems. This is a dripper drip system on one of my apple trees. And then there's the soaker hoses. So there's a number of ways to do it. Um, there's a lot of wastewater in our households that we may not be designed to use it automatically, but it's not difficult to use to collect it uh, and just use it to quickly water, in this case, a rhododendron. 
this is something that just fits in my sink. And when I'm washing vegetables or rinsing dishes or something, that's all clean water. And if you dump it into something like a milk jug funnel that's buried in the soil, you can just quickly dump the water there and it'll slowly leak out for that plant. If you tried to quickly dump this whole trug of water on top of the rhododendron, it would just run out on the pathway. But this cause this allows it to soak in very slowly. You can do that with vegetables too. I know people that grow hills of squash around and they just bury a pot bottle upside down with the bottom cut out of the pot bottle, um, like a funnel like this. They just bury it in with the squash and then they've got a little reservoir that's really easy to fill with water from, you know, if you're running the shower water, you know, waiting for the shower to get warm enough to get into, that's all just perfectly clean water that would be going down the drain. You can collect rainwater. I, I don't know how much use there is in collecting those little rain barrels of water. You see that a lot of rain barrel you know, advocacy of rain barrels. It's, it's not completely useless, but it's not much water. So we, our water happens in the winter. We don't get any water in the summer. So in a climate where it's dry and, and it's, uh, the summer has periodic rain, the rain barrels work better. Otherwise for us, you, if you're going to collect a significant amount of water, you need these big tanks. So, but you can get a surprising amount of water this is, um, I'm only collecting water off of half of the roof of a small, very small single car garage. It's just off one roof, one side of the roof. And this is my 2000 gallons of, of water. And, and even this year, which was very dry and it's been quite delayed, the tanks are full now. Well, again, now that's how to make the gardens more resilient, but how can, as gardeners, we help to actually address the problem of, of climate change. The problem is we've got too much carbon in the atmosphere and we would like to absorb some of it. And carbon, uh, plants are made of carbon. That's what they are. And uh, during photosynthesis, they take that carbon out of the atmosphere and build a plant with it. And it's held in the plant tissue and in their roots. It's also in the soil, the humus in the soil, the organic matter. Um, the organisms that live in the soil. And we now know that actually this carbonic acid is goes very deep in the soil from the living roots as well. All of that carbon is more stable and stays there. It's not up in the atmosphere. So, you know, every gardener, I think, loves to be told to plant more plants. So maximizing the amount of living root material throughout the soil is is going to hold more carbon. So add more plants. Wherever you've got beds, think about adding more plants to those beds. Increase the density of the plantings, add things that grow on the fences and climb up the side of the house. Um, if you've got shrubs and trees, you, there's a lot of ground covers and, and material that can grow. Even ferns and things can grow under quite shady conditions. The deep soil carbon is deposited by plant roots is probably the most valuable and it's deposited by living plants. This is a view of my lower, I have a, <laughs> it's not actually a very big garden, but it's full of trees and on the fences I have roses and the rock wall are completely planted. And between the trees, even the pathway here has thyme and, and creeping um, plants in between. So Really, there is not really an inch of soil that doesn't have a living plant. There's grapevines up here. It's, it's solidly planted up. So you can leave yourself a, an access pathway that's as wide as you need to, but then pack all those plants into all the beds, wherever, you, wherever there's space. And you can get a lot in a very small space. This gardener, it's a tiny little backyard and you know, there's lovely little irises and things, but there's wisteria and roses and a peach tree and you know things going all over the place vertically. So these deep rooted perennial plants are really valuable at holding carbon. Very, the, very much the opposite of what this was, this was considered a low maintenance landscape, enough said. So build soil organic matter, the, the, the carbon that is held in the humus, which is really completely decomposed organic matter, lasts a long time and, and it has all kinds of other benefits. Obviously it improves the structure of the soil and holds water and um, makes nutrients available to plants. Interestingly, um, when you drop crop residue or leaves or any organic matter, mulches and things on the surface of the soil, 
it actually builds soil organic matter faster than turning it in. So I call chop it, chop and drop for my vegetable garden. I just chop and drop it, things right there on the spot. You know, if you're weeding, the weeds, if they don't have seeds in them yet, you can just drop them right there. They'll go very quickly um, into the soil. They'll be pulled into the soil and dissolve. I just leave prunings on the surface of the soil. The roots of plants add a lot of organic matter. So anytime you're harvesting, uh, this is a corn plant here. If you harvest a corn plant and pull up the roots to compost it, all of this organic matter um, is being removed from your garden. But if you just chop off your corn plant or, or whatever other, other plants you uh, at, at harvest time and leave it in the garden over the winter, this is what you get in the spring. So this is the little knob of, of corn stalk all of these roots stayed in the soil and they've completely decomposed by spring. So it just adds more and more organic matter, much faster than digging in compost. Um, compost is an excellent soil amendment. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, not at all saying don't use compost, I absolutely do. But the fastest way to build organic matter is to leave the roots in the soil and to add organic matter to the surface of the soil. Minimize disturbing the soil. It's disturbing the soil that releases the car, uh, speeds up the release of carbon, partly because it's disrupting the soil organisms that hold, that are actually holding that carbon. So no-till methods. Anytime you can plant a vegetable crop right after another one, this is where peas, spring peas were finished and I just cut them down, left the roots in the soil, put the vines on top of the soil, and I'm already just putting cauliflower. And all I had to do was just cut the pea vines down. I'm not disturbing the soil. I'm not digging it uh, uh, over or adding any amendments because peas actually add nitrogen to the soil anyway. So it was all ready to go. This is corn. This is a corn bed. This was the summer corn. You can see where the corn stalks were all cut. And I, it's hard to see in this picture, but coming up right now in between are all the little seeds of leafy greens for winter time. To seeds I'm going to eat in in uh, in the winter time. I sowed them in August as the plants were being cut. So plant whenever you can without cultivating, and if you do have to cultivate, try and keep it just into the surface surface layers, very light, very just you know seven centimeters, couple inches. And always try and control weeds by smothering them under mulches. And if you do that, they will be controlled at a very early stage, um, as opposed to having to pull up really big, well-established weeds and disturb the soil. Compost with care. Poorly made compost um, that's allowed to get soggy and smelly. Uh, you know, some of these, you know, if you're putting things into your green bin or your... Um, not your green bin, the uh, like the green tower or the black plastic composters. If your kitchen waste is going in there, it often just goes in there and becomes a soggy, wet mess. And when that happens, that compost is releasing methane. And methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas. It would have been far better not to try to compost that material if you're going to produce methane with it. You're losing it to the atmosphere and you're losing nutrients. So the way you would maintain uh, better conditions in your plastic composter is every time you put in a um, container of kitchen waste, you put in one or two containers of dry leaves or straw or shredded paper, some of this very dry, carb, high carbon material. So it's layered in every single time. Then you will have a compost that is much better compost, but you're not going to be losing nutrients. Um, and never put lime or wood ashes from a fireplace or something, but never put lime in your compost while you're making it. The alkaline conditions uh, are also cause a loss of nitrogen to the atmosphere, and that's another greenhouse gas. If you're not going to compost this way, um, sending things through the municipal composting system through your green bin is just great then don't put your garden waste into a compost, just chop it all up and leave it on the ground. This, you don't get into this risk of aeration and methane production and things like that if you're just using your garden uh, stalks and old leaves and things, if you're just chopping that up and using it as a surface mulch. And I'll just say this is kind of 
my last thing, consider reducing the area of your annual gardens and lawns. If you have a vegetable garden of a certain size, but you learn to grow really intensively and don't actually need all that space for vegetables, or if you have a lawn of a certain size, but you really, you know, you could cut that size down and still have a strip of lawn that might, you know, give you the effect you would like in your yard. Anytime you can then take that extra land and plant native trees, native vegetation, plants for insects, lots of flowers for pollinators, wildlife habitat, all of those things will help hold carbon, but also, in fact, you know, in the case of planting for pollinators, which is really a whole other subject that we can get into sometime, um, those things also um, help our environment and hold carbon better than our annual vegetables. So I, I try and garden on my vegetable garden on the smallest area I can so that I can also grow a lot of plants for other purposes. So rethinking lawns, uh, West Coast Seeds has a lot of options for lawns that don't have to be mowed much, oh, that produce flowers and things. Uh, moving to ground covers that are perennials, you know, have some lawn and change the as much of the lawn over to um, perennials and shrubs, they're going to hold a lot more ca uh, um, carbon. And a lot of them are flowering and feed the pollinators. So, um, well, this is my, I've taken the vegetable garden thing a little bit to an extreme. I Nobody can find a pathway in my garden by the end of the summer, but it's, uh, you know, it works for me. Um, you know, I don't like to waste a lot of space. Other things you can do as a gardener is not buy peat moss, use other materials. The peat bogs on the planet hold more carbon than all of the forests on the planet put together. And by harvesting that, we are removing a, a big carbon sink that we really shouldn't be. There are other alternatives, core, which is the waste coconut fiber, uh, your own compost or locally made compost, and there's other kinds of wood fiber as well that are all waste materials and can certainly replace peat moss. Try and eliminate plastic from your gardening. Now, you, every, we all have plastic items and it's such useful material to be lightweight, waterproof, things like that. And I, I, I think it's gonna be very hard to replace some of them in gardening, but make what you have last as long as possible by keeping it out of hot sun and you know, washing, putting away plastic, storing it out of the sun, um, you know, you can use recycled plastic containers. I mean, I have some recycled containers around that I know I've had them for 15 years. They seem to last forever. So use what you've got and, and take very good care of it. And then just don't buy more. And certainly some of these things like plastic mulches and landscape fabric are just, they're actually quite, um, quite disastrous to use in the landscape anyway. It's a real waste of plastic. So. Be careful about your plastic use and try and eliminate as much as you can. Minimizing the use of nitrogen fertilizer, the uh, artificially made nitrogen fertilizer, that requires a lot of energy to make and nitrous oxide is released to the atmosphere in the process of um, the plants using it and the processes of it being applied to gardens and nitrous oxide is another greenhouse gas. So organic gardeners would be using composts and composted manure and organic material that are higher in nitrogen. There's waste. Um, we have some locally made composts made out of fish waste and wood, wood waste together, which gets rid of two, um, prob two, two um, disposal problems. One is fish guts and the other is wood waste. Compost them together and suddenly we have an incredibly valuable high nitrogen fertilizer or compost for our gardens. So resilient gardeners, gardens have resilient gardeners or vice versa, you get a resilient gardener and then you'll have resilient gardens. So this just kind of sums up what I've just been, been talking about. Design your plants and manage your gardens um, to protect things from heat and cold and drought. So this means be on top of the weather forecast and choose plants that are going to toler tolerate more variable weather, which means stay away from things that are borderline hardy here or aren't going to take the heat. Look for disease resistant varieties 
and and just be really flexible about planting your say your vegetable garden if you think something's not working out just get it out and plant something that will work for whatever the weather is uh, at the time so listening to weather forecasts and acting promptly um, when we get a heat wave you need to have those heat covers on before the heat wave hits so be right on top of that and then everything you can do to hold carbon in the soil, whether it's mulching or adding more deep-rooted perennial plants and diverse year-round plants, all of those things are all to the good. And, you know, making some long-term plans. I mean, some of these things are not easily changed in one year. So you might want to plan to replace trees or um, add some rainwater storage or these things that cost, take time and money. You can plan those out. Um, but just be really prepared for extreme weather all around and then do whatever you can to have your garden and landscape capture the carbon. And of course, for long term, we need to all be working at our community level and our prov provincial and national and global efforts to reduce our greenhouse gas output. And, and but we're, we're, we're now well into having to learn to adapt to it. The climate has changed and it will continue to change. But we can do this. So I'm happy to take questions. If anyone that's on online has questions at this point. Ellie. Hi, thank you very much for this. Um, my question is, I leave my um, leaves on the ground mm -hmm. uh, in, in my Vancouver garden uh, all winter, um, and they get pretty slimy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, like, are they doing what they should do if, if they're, like, wet and slimy? You know uh, what yes, because that's just a process of decomposition. They, they'll, and you'll probably notice like after we had all this heavy snow, they're really squashed down and flattened. So yeah. if you if you're using them to keep the soil warm around vegetables, are you, is it is it flower gardens or vegetables or it's what? Flowers and a few veggies interspersed. Yeah. Well, you can fluff it up a little bit. You know, you can just fluff it up with a stick or a rake or leave it. It's still doing all the things it should be doing. And, and you'll probably notice that they don't seem to be, nothing much has happened to the leaves. They're just soggy and slimy and they pretty much look like when you put them on. Yes. But starting in March, as the soil gets warmer, between March and May, you'll find those leaves just, they just disappear because the soil organisms wake up from being dormant from the cold and the worms wake up and everybody starts actively getting to going. And then by the time you're planting, you'll think, well, there's hardly anything left on the surface of the soil. It just disappears. So slimy is natural. And I had someone ask me what to put on. They had used leaves between uh, their beds as a pathway and it was slippery. And in that case, it, you know, something like wood chips might be a better pathway material to prevent them being slippery and then use the leaves on the, the soil around the plants as you've done. I do have little stone pathways, like I yeah. saw. Yeah, so that's that's safer to be. Oh, I just you know. kind of broom them off uh, yeah. Yeah. so I can walk in there. And yeah, you, you can't go wrong feeding your soil with leaves. It's like the best thing we've got, and it's free. <laughs> I know, and it comes down. I have a giant crooked willow there, yes. and so that's what it's from but the poor crooked willow got quite broken um, a lot of, and a heavy snow yeah a lot and, of uh, branches that we still have to get i mean it's a giant tree so we yeah. still have to get up there and yeah well willows are on the breakable tree list and you know that's what's going to keep happening yeah um, I have another question. I've been trying to, um, we have another place on the Seashell Inlet that has, um, it's very, gets very dry. And uh, I've been trying to actually plant uh, little arbutuses there because I need something that will tolerate sort of salty-ish soil. Yeah. Not that it comes up, but 
it, you know, the wind spray and stuff. Now, I've never been successful planting little arbutuses that I've got from you know, other. Are the deer eating them or what's happening? I mean, deer. Oh, it's them. not deer. They just fry because we're west face. Yeah. yeah, you might. You might try something um, that protects them, like put in some other plants that might be more durable to the heat that will shade those little trees. Or you might move to something like manzanita, which is a smaller shrub. It's related and it does kind of the same thing. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, or just look at what um, is growing naturally in the wild areas with a similar area and go. We have enough wild plant nurseries around that you probably can get that material and start with that. So I would get that established. And once there's a good ground cover and the soil right. is protected from the heat, then you might get the trees established. Or you might decide that you just like some of the other native vegetation that would ordinarily grow in that kind of environment. Yeah, we do have like wild roses growing in front yeah. of very rocky, very little soil. Yeah. Well, I go with what's already trying to grow there naturally and see if you can get that going first. Okay, thank you very much. This has been great. I could probably ask a thousand. <laughs> Thanks so much, Linda. That was really great. Okay. Oh, what a great presentation. I got a lot out of it too. I'm a bit of a new gardener. So oh, good. <laughs> it gave me food for thought. Yeah, it's a little daunting. Uh, you know, trying to have a vegetable garden, it's not like it was 30 or 40 years ago, but it's still quite doable. It's just that. It's just not like it was, you know, it's not as easy as it was. It's, we've got a lot more to contend with now than we used to, but it, we can still do it. You know, it's just, you know, you just need to know a little bit more. Yeah. And as a new gardener, well, we planted a little apple tree in the backyard, mm -hmm. I guess about six or seven years ago. And two years ago, we got our first batch of apples. I was so excited. And then we got nothing last year. And I kept thinking, oh, what did I do? And then once I talked to a few people, I realized it wasn't me. So that made me feel better. But I, mm -hmm. it's hard to know. I'm like, oh, was I supposed to have done something? You know, what did I? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, apples can be tricky. You put in one apple tree and then realize after five years, you're not getting any fruit because there's no cross pollinator. Right. So, or, or it could be a variety that really, you know, you let it have a nice crop one year and next year it doesn't have a crop because it's been, uh, it, it produced too much the first year. Oh, okay. So, and that's what's called biennial bearing. Like oh, okay. a tree will, tree will kick it into being heavy crop and then no crop, heavy crop, no crop. And you can, um, snap it out of that by thinning the apples. When you do get a crop, you'd be really good about thinning them. Oh, okay. And so you'll get kind of a moderately large crop and a moderately small crop, and you'll get, you'll get a crop every year. Right. But if you let the tree do what it wants to do and it overdoes it, then it has no food stored up for those buds next spring. I see. They can't, they can't do anything. They just like fall off the tree or it may not even flower. Yeah. So it, it's just exhausted itself. So it, when, a, when an apple tree is growing in the summertime, it's actually doing three things. And you can see it grow. You can see it putting on new leaves. So it's doing that. You can see it maturing the apples it's got. So you can see that. But what you can't see is that in the, that growing season, it's also storing food in the buds for next year. Oh, interesting. So if it's got too much of a job to do to grow and produce the apples it's got, what gets scamped is those buds for next year. Mm. And so there's nothing you can do next year or even good pollination won't help because the tree is not got, you know, it hasn't stored up that food. Right. And you can't see that happening or not happening. So it's, um, you'll get familiar with your trees. I have one, one tree that tends to do that. And, and I have a little relationship with that tree where I have to remember to this, you can, you cannot keep all those apples. They are going, I'm going to have to get in there and really prune that fruit out every spring after the fruit sets. And sort of at the end of June, the tree has now decided what it's going to keep. You go in there and thin it. Okay. And everywhere there was a blossom cluster, there might be five, five blossoms there, or even six, there should be one apple. So if there's two or three, just you've got to pick the best one, leave the best one on there and pull the other right, one. Right, okay. And that's that usually gets you, uh, that prevents you from uh, letting a tree just go crazy and sort of starve itself for next year. Right, okay. Okay, well, that's good advice. Yeah, I'll do that this year and see how it goes. All righty. 
Thank you. You're very oh, welcome. Can I just ask one more since we're on the apple thing? Sure. <laughs> My house came with a, a a dwarf apple. I have no idea what kind it is. It it was probably planted when the house was built over a hundred years ago. Um, it is a, a very good producer, um, except last year. Well, now, did it have flowers last year? Very few. Uh huh. Very few. Well, yes. I mean, last year, a lot of people had flowers. They didn't get pollinated. But yeah. if you didn't really have many flowers, then think about what might have happened the year before. Was it too dry? Uh, the thing that also affects whether they have enough food stored in the buds. If they've been stressed in the previous growing system that was too dry or too hot, or the, you know, the tree can also be getting old. You know, <laughs> yeah, it can. They do. They don't live forever. You know, so um, this year, be really alert to things like you know whether the tree needs some irrigation water this summer and heat because it's next year's crop that you'll feel the problem if you. If, if it doesn't get what it needs this year, next year is when you'll see the, the result. I didn't realize that they stored next year's. Yeah, because when you think about it, when the flowers come out, there's no leaves, right? Well, right. So they, can't, they can't feed the leaves. They can't feed those flower buds right then. They have had to have stored the food for those flower buds the previous season. And you know, when you think about it now, it makes sense, except I know you're absolutely right. When I remember when I learned that, I was like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it had to be what happened to the tree the previous season was going to affect how those buds are going to fare. Because, uh, you know, yeah, you're right. There's no leaves in the spring to feed anything. So whatever it has, it already has. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that helps to just look, think backwards, and I guess. And trying to yeah it out. yeah yeah um one more thing about I saw you had a soaker hose yeah and I, I that's what I want I don't want any fancy I I irrigation system yeah this is pretty simple system I got those at Lee Valley Tools yeah I like theirs because uh, they're quite good quality and I they last about 10 years before they get uh, they get kind of brittle. I just leave them permanently there. I mulch over them. I garden in between them. I don't take the system up. But right. there are other systems too. I mean, there are some much cheaper systems of just thin tubing with perforations. Now that, that works too. And they're very flexible. You can curve them all around and put them wherever you want to. So yeah. some of them kind of baked last year though. And well, mulch, put the, put the mulch over them. All right. <laughs> you know, mulch right over them because that protects them from the sun, but also allows the moisture to keep soaking around under the mulch, too. We'll write that down. Thank you. Well, that's good to know because I have those, but I take them up every year. And No, no need to do it. And, you know, if I really need to do something to a bed unusual, you can kind of lay them over to the side. You don't have to take them all up everywhere. You can kind of push it over. But mostly I leave them right in place because I'm not really disturbing the soil much ever between crops. Hmm. I'm putting everything on the soil. And so, uh, yeah, just leave them in place and protect them, you know, from the, from the sun. That's the damaging thing will be the sun. And yeah. what about the winter, like the freezing? Shouldn't hurt them unless there's water standing in them. But if it says those soaker hoses, the water drips all out. You know, they won't be holding water like a plastic irrigation pipe would hold water. But the soaker hoses just drain away. And if there's no more water coming down the pipe for the winter, um, they're fine. I've never had mine. I mean, they're not damaged by winter. Excellent. Okay. Thank all you. All right. Thanks so much, Linda. You're very welcome. Right. Take care. I, I heard a hint back. Did you hear my dog just do a little bark? That was the the dog is going. It was three o'clock some time ago. My dog goes, Ellie. My dog has to uh, go for walks at three o'clock, and she's making her point. So, okay. Take care, everyone. Take care.